Okay, boys and girls, I got a lot of information to get through, so let's just get started. <laughs> so the Constitution of 1850 clearly required at least revision for it still sanctioned slavery and did not adequately deal with the new issues such as corporations and railroads. Uh -oh. So this is right after the, the Tate scandal, James W. Honest Dick Tate of Frankfurt, a state treasurer. On March 14, 1888, he packed some bags for a trip to Louisville and Cincinnati, never seen from again. Um, uh, finally, a clerk recalled that Honest Dick had filled two large sacks with gold and silver coins and had taken a large roll of bills with him onto his final trip. So the uh, Honest Dick tape took off and nobody ever saw or heard from him again. And, um, and that was a treasure, so who knows why that had happened. But the 1850 Constitution couldn't provide for... Um, the reason of why um, Honest Dick Tate had fucking fled and took off, so um, since it couldn't. Uh, <laughs> this is cracking me up, man. I get that way. There's some. I'm not sure if my head is right for it. Okay. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Okay, so new constitution. So you have honest dictate that's um, you know sitting there robbing the fucking treasury of all the coins and the silver from Kentucky. And honest dictate is one of the reasons why we need a new constitution. 1891, a new constitution is called for. And so um, the constitution 1850 clearly required at least provision for a still sanctioned slavery, and it didn't adequately deal with new issues such as corporations and railroads. So these are all issues that are that are saying why the you know 1850 um, uh, constitution is no good. So you know there's corporations, uh, there's railroads, which are railroads are everywhere now, and then there's slavery. So slavery was still you know it's still sanctioned slavery. The constitution did, but. Um, the the country had already outlawed it, so why are we still continuing an institution that didn't need to be continued? So, calls for a new convention had been made for two decades, but finally in 1889, vote made that possibility a reality. So for two decades, right, for over 20 years, they're calling for a convention. It's so fucking hard. It's the most impossible fucking thing in the fucking world to get a convention called in, in Kentucky. It took 10 years or 10 conventions just to get the state established. And then once they realized that the fucking document was shitty, it took them about three years to get it, you know, um, fixed. And then that was only good for about 50 years. And then as soon as this thing's passed, it's, it's shit right after the end of the Civil War. So, excuse me. 100 delegates representing each district in the Kentucky House of Representatives were selected. They convened in Frankfurt on September 8, 1890, met for 226 days, and signed the result of their deliberation on April 11, 1891. The process was long, controversial, and not always fruitful. Not unexpectedly, the delegates were a very lot. There are 60 attorneys, 20 farmers, 13 doctors, 7 business leaders. Almost one-fifth of them had been elected as representatives of the Farmers Alliance and spoke out chiefly on those issues of importance to agrarians, limited government, control corporations, railroad regulation, and the like. The delegates at the convention include a former governor, current governor, future governor, and the uncle and brother of two other governors. About a dozen middle-level political figures form the core of those involved in most deliberations. However, in short, the group of delegates was competent but not exceptional. So there's this is another time when 1966 they had got a lot of fucking governors on board this new sort of constitutional revision committee, and so that's why they thought they was going to get it passed. But the Kentucky voters said no fucking way. So unfortunately, the, the delegates often operated like oarsmen in a boat with no one steering, with no particular person to lead, and with a piecemeal rather than a considered approach to constitution making. The convention seemed to flounder. Delegates spent long hours offering resolutions or debating procedural minor matters minor matters what one delegate termed lengthy aerial flights of oratory emanated on virtually every subject delegates ignored William M. Beckner's advice that they should fashion a flexible document to give posterity a chance unable to agree on broad statements they instead then then degenerated almost to making laws in the form of a constitution through very specific sections which, as it turned out, were often quickly outdated. 
fresh from the Tate scandal, the delegates did not trust government or its leaders very much. They therefore limited officials' time in office and fashioned a re restrictive document that re reflected their suspicion of power and those who wielded it. The document they drafted in 1890 and 1891 would tra change drastically over the years as a result of various constitutional amendments. Its chief provisions at the time included the following. Number one, the basic Bill of Rights from the 1792 Constitution was retained except for the slavery provision. The General Assembly would consist of a House of Representatives of 100 members elected to two-year terms and a Senate of 38 members serving four-year terms. The executive branch would consist of the governor and other constitutional officers all elected for four-year terms with restrictions restrictions on selection on the chief executive's absence from the state. The lieutenant governor automatically assumed the power of the office. This provision was later amended. The judicial branch would consist of a court of appeals made up of five to seven members elected for eight-year terms and a system of circuit, quarterly, county justice of the peace and police courts. The General Assembly was forbidden to create any courts other than those in the Constitution. And that's later amended. Under more general provisions, the Railroad Commission was given constitutional sanction to help its regulatory powers. Lotteries were abolished. Later amended salaries of state officials were restricted to $5,000 per year. Later amended state elections would be held in November instead of August would be by secret ballot rather than voice voting and would be limited to males over the age of 21 later amended an efficient system of schools had to be maintained and must be racially segregated later amended the creation of new counties was made more difficult as soon as it was written the new constitution attracted critics including Henry Watterson who, ex uh, who opposed its limitations and restrictions as well as its bundle of statutes disguised as a constitution Others dis dislike some of the reform elements, such as the Strengthened Railroad Commission and the LNN campaigned against adoption. But the framers had reflected the will of a fear of a state, fearful of power, distrustful of politicians, and careful of prerogatives. And the Constitution was adopted by a statewide vote of 212,914 to 74,523. Then, in a strange move, the delegates reassembled for almost a month made several changes, some of them significant, and signed a new final draft. Not voted on in that form by the people. The document was tested in the courts, but eventually approved. At long last, the Constitution of 1891 was complete. The problems it would create, however, had only begun. So, in a strange move, the delegates reassembled for almost a month, made several changes, some of them significant, and signed a new final draft. So this is after, after the people you know, you want to assume it was housekeeping and shit, and then the corpse eventually approved it. But since they made several changes, the significant changes, then that means that it should have been held up to approval for the for the new court. Um, there is the old court, new court controversy, which I think would be relevant. But I want to read actually this article um, up here first. So, yeah, I'm just going to actually write that down for other things. So, the old court, new court, and then the um, Confederate Constitution. I want to mention that, so I don't know if I'll get time to do that or not. And then, and then I, need to get, I need to get back on in base. I need to start figuring out um, how, uh, you know, I need to just get back to, to connecting American politics to Kentucky politics and how that actually all shakes down. So... Um, right now I'm going to go, I'm going to read this document here. Okay, so this is Kentucky Government, Politics and Public Policy, edited by James C. Klinger, Michael W. something. So it's talking about the 1850, so it's right at the, the same thing we just read, basically the 1891 Constitution. What, had, what were the problems of the 1850 Constitution? You had the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, so it was outdated. They had slavery. Complaints after the Civil War. Complaints about the, the Third Constitution. There's railroad companies, and then there's the um, corporations. So after Civil War, complaints about the Third Constitution began to surface. Many of which had to do with railroad corporations and the legislature. Railroad mileage in Kentucky tripled between 1865 and 1880, with the powerful, incredibly profitable Louisville, Nashville radio leading the way. Shippers, especially farmers, complained that the railroads charged too much and discriminated in favor of large shippers against the smaller ones. The power, powerful railroad lobby outflanked agrarian forces that attempted to persuade the legislature to enact reforms that would curb the power of the Louisville, Nashville, 
and other corporations. The lobby rewarded legislatures free railroad passes, whiskey, and other forms of remuneration, and thus ensured that even when the legislature created a railroad commission, that agency lacked meaningful authority. So the railroad commission was to, you know, be there to regulate the railroads, but eventually the railroad commission, which had little fucking bite to begin with, is repealed, okay? So we're going to see Kentucky's Constitution, 1891 Constitution, just absolutely get mangled, just absolutely, just, uh, just butchered, okay? Just chopped up into little bitty pieces. You can't even really tell what part is the original Constitution, what part is the amendment, you know, what's, what's up, what's down. There's nothing makes sense about this document. Um, and so it, it seems to me that it's, 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 it's anarchy in Kentucky. There's, <laughs> there's no commonality. There's no common framework between um, folks who understand any of this, okay? I can bet you I could do a test of a lot of the leaders in Kentucky about the interpretation of these laws, which there will be some right answers and wrong answers, but I bet you there'll be a lot of, there'll be a divergent of opinions about, you know, just what's, what's free speech. <laughs> I, don't know, you know, I don't know. So the, um, the lobby rewarded legislatures with free railroad passes, whiskey, other forms of remuneration, and thus ensured that even when the legislature created a railroad commission, that agency lacked meaningful authority. In 1884, the legislature enacted a statute that granted new railroad construction a five-year tax exemption. The lobby also defeated efforts to strengthen the railroad commission and to enact tort reform, including enhanced opportunity to sue railroads for wrongful death. So you can't sue railroads for wrongful death, even though they have a lot of money, and if they're responsible for somebody dying, I mean, that's some bullshit. Critics especially complained about the legislature the legislative preoccupation with local, private, and special legislation to the detriment of statutes that apply to the Commonwealth in general. As an example, the legislative imbalance, the General Assembly of 1887 to 1888 enacted 1,403 local and private statutes and only 168 general statutes. So 1,400 local and private statutes is probably for their buddies and for their friends, but 168 general statute was for the whole state. So it's saying that most people were given, you know, uh, the statutes to their friends and shit. So there is no general law that classified and empowered municipalities, municipalities, which meant that towns and cities had to obtain their charters from the legislature, and these charters differed in their powers and limitations. The lack of a married woman's property act meant that wives needed to secure private legislation if they wished to have control over their own property. Sheriffs often secured special laws that extended periods of tax collection. Individual counties received legislative permission in the form of local statutes to punish certain crimes in special ways, such as whipping those found guilty of petite larceny. Consequently, there are so many exceptions to the general statutes that even lawyers were uncertain about what the law of Kentucky was on many subjects. Another grievance concerned the, t the tendency of the legislature to create special criminal or civil courts to compensate for the constitutional limitation on the number of circuit courts. Critics argued that at the time the legislature, uh, legislature devoted to private, local, and special legislation led to inordinately lengthy and expensive legislative sessions and statutes that were frequently enacted without having been debated or even read. The Constitution limited each session to 60 days unless two-thirds of the membership of each house voted to extend the session, but extensions were easily and routinely approved. Although the Third Constitution limited state borrowing, there were no limitations on the county indebtedness, and many counties borrowed heavily to attract railroads, which were regarded as a key to economic progress. Not a few of these transportation ventures failed and left the counties without a railroad, but a, with a legally binding debt, this indebtedness rendered a few counties insolvent and caused taxpayer revolts that bordered on anarchy and demands for constitutional limits on local indebtedness. Another financial scandal involved the often elected uh, state treasurer w, James W. Honest Dick Tate, who absconded in 1888 with almost the entire state treasury in the amount of $247,000 prompting demands for a constitutional reform of Tate's office, as well as that of the state auditor, the constitutionally mandated method of ca casting votes by voice rather than by secret ballot constituted another grievance. Critics argued that the public nature of voice voting led to the commonplace practice of buying and selling votes because voice voting occurred and public vote buyers could readily determine whether vote sellers had fulfilled the sales contract a defect that could be cured by only a constitutional requirement for secretly 
cast a written ballot. Blah, 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 blah. So lots of reasons for the 1850 document being wiped out. Um, we're going to come up, I'm going to keep on reading this document because there's a lot of uh, uh, constitutional conventions and amendments that they try to change it. And it's so fucking hard to change Kentucky's 1891 fucking outdated and confusing and archaic um, ancient document uh, that's still in play today.